now we, we move to uh, Dr. Ishalai Gursu, who is the Assistant Director of the British Institute of Archaeology at Ankara, very good too, who is going to talk about her, her work, uh, more anthropological work, uh, understanding the public, public archaeology in science and science. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I have been working at the British Institute at Ankara for the last seven years as the Cultural Heritage Management Research Fellow and we have been doing quite a lot of interesting projects on cultural heritage management and two of them I would like to share with you today. And the, the theoretical framework that we adopted for these projects is uh, public archaeology and I take a very simple way of explaining public archaeology to understand the existing relationship between public and archaeology and to build activities based on this understanding. I mean I know it sounds very simple but once you're on the field and trying to do something it's quite easy to miss the first part which is to understand the existing relationship between archaeology and people and start building activities very enthusiastically, very good willing activities, but maybe not based on an understanding which is already there. So uh, there is a story that I love, which is told by an, NGO, an Italian NGO worker. He talks about his own experience in Zambia, and it's like one and a half minute movie because he's so great in telling the story. I would like to show it to you, so you see what I mean by understanding the local community. Our first project, the one that has inspired my first book, Ripples from the Zambezi, was a project where we Italians uh, decided to teach Zambian people how to grow food. So we arrived there with Italian seeds in southern Zambia in this absolutely magnificent valley uh, going down to the Zambezi River and we taught the local people how to grow Italian tomatoes and zucchini <laughs> and of course the local people had absolutely no interest in doing that so we paid them to come and work and sometimes they would show up <laughs> and we were amazed that the local people in such fertile valley would not have any agriculture and, uh, but instead of asking them how come they were not growing anything, we simply said, thank God we're here. <laughs> Just in the nick of time to save the Zambian people from starvation. <laughs> and of course, everything in Africa grew beautifully. And we had these magnificent tomatoes. In, in Italy, a tomato would grow to this size, in Zambia, to this size. <laughs> and we could not believe. And we were telling the Zambians, look how easy agriculture is. When the tomatoes were nice and ripe and red, overnight, some 200 hippos came out of the, from the river and they ate everything. <laughs> and we said to the Zambians, my God, the hippos. And the Zambia said, yes, that's why we have no agriculture here. <laughs> why didn't you tell us? You never asked. <laughs> I said he's so great in telling the story that I wanted to show it to you, what, what it means and what happens when you never ask. So the projects that I'm going to refer to are trying to ask uh, what archaeology means to people and how it can create economic and social benefits and what these benefits are for the local communities instead of us going there and assuming economic or social benefits are this and this. So uh, the first one is uh, Living Amid the Ruins project and it actually builds on a 30 year of uh, survey work again Stephen Mitchell and Lutgard Van der Poot who are with us today and um, it won um, a British Academy Award, a sustainable development um, project it's called Archaeological Sites as Hubs of Sustainable Development in Southwest Turkey. So we are talking about uh, north of Antalya, Burdur and Sparta region and about s quite small archaeological sites in the middle of a fantastic nature. Um, and these sites were not known and they were not almost never visited. Uh, but as I said, uh, thanks to that maybe, they were quite well preserved but they were also quite forgotten so that they were quite um, increasing the subject to, to looting. So the idea was to create a framework in which this whole region could be known, uh, but not with, not with um, any kind of physical intervention. So 
we decided to, and it, since it's a big region, and we are talking about quite a lot of archaeological sites in this region, uh, the methodology that we used was to come up with a long distance, but I really mean it's long, it's 350 kilometers long distance uh, walking trail that connected each of these archaeological sites to each other which meant that we didn't need to do something on these sites, but we could also talk about these sites in one, uh, under one umbrella. Once we started doing the field work for this um, trail, we had a chance to actually talk to people even more in detail. And our idea at the beginning was actually something that Agnes Disroli was just criticizing. We actually thought bringing economic benefits in this way would be something good and welcomed. The more time we spend with the local communities, and see, although these are very close to each other, and these are mountain villages and rural communities, we saw that one community had very different ideas of what they expected from the archaeological research the sites that was uh, just in their backyard, from the other one, which was maybe 10 kilometers away from each other. So we decided to do, have a look at, have a more in-depth look into the uh, communities there. So this is how Living Amid the Ruins project came to life. And it had three aims, basically. The first one is, was to understand the existing relationship between these people and the archaeological sites, and defining social and economic benefits and protection of at the end of the day, we were, of course, always thinking how to protect the archaeological site, which is not only subject to illicit digging, but also construction projects that Scott was just showing, the dams, the stone quarries. So the idea of protection is also quite enlarging. So uh, sometimes, uh, these days, you find archaeological sites as the only barrier against the destruction, because if a site is enlisted as a first-degree archaeological site, then there is some um, hope that that landscape can be preserved. Because otherwise, if it's just a landscape without an archaeological site in it, it's even easier to get the approval to open up new quarries and, uh, or building up new dams. Um, the, actually, the, most, um, the, the methodology that we used was to uh, do socio-anthropological field work. We talked to 124 people, so we asked to, to 124 people. It might sound like I'm not too many, but uh, you have to consider that these, these villages are basically... Um, th there are no more young people, most of the uh, populations are aging, and the number of populations is decreasing every day. So we managed to reach out to quite a good number of uh, residents, and it was done by uh, experts who stayed in these places for five months. The, the basic um, outcome, actually, is a short documentary which I'm going to advise you to have a look at. We are very proud of this documentary, because I don't want to tell you uh, what they, they told us. I, if you have a chance, please go on the BIA's YouTube channel, just write Living Amid the Ruins, and it has English subtitles, so you can actually watch what, how people are defining all these benefits. So how people and how people see a future for these archaeological sites, how they have a relationship, an already existing relationship with, with the with the archaeology. So it, they don't actually need us to go and say or do something about it. It's already there. And uh, this uh, movie was a great way of documenting that, and with maybe some of the people or some of the landscapes that we are not going to be able to see. I don't know, 15, 20 years of time. So I am not going to show it here because it's 13 minutes, but I'm advising you to have a look at it if you're, if you're interested in community projects. Uh, and another reason why I am not going to show you the movie because I want to show you the results of another project, which was a bit more um, different in scale than the Living Amid the Ruins. This, this, was, um, this came to life uh, in 2017. The name is Sarat, I, the abbreviation, Safeguarding Archaeological Assets of Turkey. So as you can imagine here, we have a more ambitious approach because we are talking about archaeological assets of Turkey. So we are not concentrating on one region, we are not concentrating on one community or rural communities. We want to be able to have a look at, at a more general view. Uh, this uh, project came to life thanks to a funding from Cultural Protection Fund administered by the British Council and the uh, DCMS. 
and it was realized with the um, with the BIA as being the leading institution in partnership with Koch University's uh, Anamet Research Center and ICOM UK. And um, we are hoping to hear good news about the extension of our project, which we will be able to share if there are any good news with you at the beginning of March probably, because it's officially coming to an end at the end of uh, March. Uh, so uh, with Sarat, we actually try to build those activities, the, the activities that is going to make archaeology more relevant to communities in Turkey. But first we said, again, we need to understand what is going on right now. Because the idea was, I have, a, I have, an, ex I have an assumption about how the Turkish communities are thinking about archaeology. Because if you say, I'm an archaeologist, you're of course there are so many people who are you know, asking stories about the, um, the, the, the treasures and the, whether they can become rich overnight. And there's this cousin that might have something in the house, whether we would be interested in looking. You're always exposed to these kinds of stories. And at the end of the day, you have this feeling like nobody cares about what we do. No, nobody wants to know about the, uh, the um, essence of our kill. Everybody's interested in the treasure. But then, is it really the case? Can we really generalize people like this? Or is it because of our standing? It's because people are approaching to us like this. So we were, these were the kind of questions that we wanted to have a look at, thanks to this uh, big project, uh, which aimed, at the end of the day, to actually safeguard archaeological heritage in Turkey. And in order to do that, the ideas were, were to increase uh, capacity in human resources, increase knowledge and appreciation, raise public awareness by promoting the scientific value and importance of uh, protecting the integrity of archaeological record. We are quite um, giving quite importance to this part especially because sometimes even though people say that they're interested and they, they love archaeology, uh, you, s you don't see that they, what they understand from archaeology is what you're trying to convey. And what I mean is the importance of getting the scientific information. And how you get that scientific information is only when you protect the context, right? Only when you have the ability to, uh, to, to go deeper. And this sometimes is not, it's not a very easy message. So we wanted to make this message quite easy and uh, deliver it to different communities by using different methods. Um, and one of these methods was, uh, was uh, um, uh, doing a public opinion poll, which I am going to come back later with some findings of the public opinion poll. But let me uh, talk about the different programs of, of this project, which try to uh, make this uh, message known to different communities. Uh, I think what made Sarat quite famous, especially in Turkey, uh, is an online certificate program which was prepared with partnership with Coach University and they have the facilities to record an online program. So we did this, um, this in partnership. And when we, when we first were thinking about how many people are going to apply to this, are there going to be enough applications, we opened the, the, we opened the process, we, we opened the, uh, the course for applications and we received was it 200? 200 in two hours or something. We were really, I remember how excited we were. And in, in two hours, we had to close down the application because there were only 2,000 people who had applied. And five days, yeah, <laughs> five days we closed it. Um, so in four terms, we received almost nine, uh, almost 8,500 applications from all over Turkey. It was in Turkish, it provided a Koch University certificate at the end, and it was re related to the safeguarding and rescuing of archaeological assets, especially in emergency situations. So this targeted to professionals, so what professionals needed to know in order to safeguard the archaeological assets in Turkey. Uh, if the project continues, we will continue offering this, uh, this uh, online program. Another leg was to do face-to-face -face interviews with registered antiquities collectors because usually they are the group that are not being approached by the archaeologists or there is always a distance. But if we are talking about the protection of the archaeological <coughs> record in its integrity, 
uh, they are at the one end of the spectrum. So we wanted to reach out and actually in a way to tell the message that if an object is taken out of its context then it loses all its scientific value. So this is the part that's still ongoing and it's going to be finalized soon. We did some work with the journalists. We came together in, uh, in workshops. We brought archaeologists and journalists <coughs> together because we found out that the, most of the people who reach out to information about archaeology are using media extensively. So if you make an imp a little bit improvement with the, with the quality of the news that journalists are producing, then you can spread again the idea about archaeology. Um, the last program, which has finished a couple of mo two months ago, is the local archaeology stakeholders uh, workshops. Um, um, sorry, archaeology and local context workshops. And these um, had the idea of distributing the outcomes of the public opinion poll, like what, what Turkish people are thinking about archaeology, as well as giving some good examples in which archaeology can create social and economic um, benefits for local communities. So we came together with different stakeholders in different cities and we discussed about the potential of archaeology for their, uh, for their provinces. <coughs> Without any further ado, I am going to tell you a little bit about what Turkish public thinks about archaeology, the outcomes of this public opinion poll. Um, this was the very first thing that we did within Sarat because we wanted like a base, an understanding of how we can relate better, how we can build up a better communication campaign to reach out to people, right? Uh, and also to um, um, to um, to be able to, to go to those cities uh, that I have just mentioned in, in order to provide the content for the workshops that we were going to do. Um, if, you, if you want to do something at a Turkey represent, or a country representative scale, of course it's different than the Living Amid the Ruiz project, the scales are very different, so this wasn't something that we could do on our own. We needed a professional company to step in the, for the collection of the data. And we worked with uh, Konda, Araştırma Şirketi, um, and they are one of the um, companies that does a lot of social research in Turkey. So they already had uh, their own networks, they have their own field, field teams, and they could do this kind of um, survey in only two days. So they, and this is how uh, these kinds of surveys uh, have been done. These are all new information for us as well, we learned along the way. We prepared 65 questions, but in consultation with this, with this firm, because sometimes our questions were really, I mean, to us it made a lot of sense, but to, when they were asked to a uh, non-professional audience, uh, there was quite a big silence. So the company made us change and simplify all the questions. So the, the answers that you are going to see in a minute are answers to very simple and direct and clear questions. So when I say Turkey representative, um, actually if you look at the you know, election results, um, when they um, have a look at the, you know, how the voters are going to um, behave, they ask almost 1,900 people. And as long as they have the right demographics, they can get um, an accurate answer to this question. We asked, we talked with 3,601 people because we wanted to be able to see the, the regional differences. So we added more um, uh, number of interviews to Istanbul, Antalya and southeast of Turkey because we wanted to, be a, we wanted to see whether there, ha there is going to be any difference. I'm going to mostly show you the Turkey uh, results, but uh, it's possible for us to say, okay, let's forget about the Turkey and let's only look at Istanbul or Antalya. Just a picture of um, from, from the field work, these were face-to-face -face interviews. So an interviewer, interviewer uh, went to the doors of each single one of these people and they asked uh, all these questions and collected all the answers. Um, the demographics is uh, very much in line with the Turkish, Turkey's demograf demographics. The, there were quite a lot of uh, ans uh, questions in the demographics part, but uh, the, the one that makes the most difference is usually the education, as you can 
imagine. Age also has an impact on the way people answer questions about archaeology. And Konda asks one question about the lifestyle. I don't know if it's going to mean a lot to a non-Turkish audience, but uh, in Turkey it, it works because they found these three categories after quite uh, years of research, and these are self-assigned categories. So they ask people to put themselves into a certain category. And they have three different boxes. So modern, traditional conservative, and religious conservative. So, uh, and as I said, <coughs> it's self-assigned. This is the most important um, demographic that makes an impact on how people respond to questions about archaeology. So, a couple of examples. Um, we wanted to see uh, in three different, um, so the, the, the whole questionnaire had three different um, aspects. The first one is understanding of archaeology. So in many of these uh, similar surveys, there is this question that always pops up as the first question. What comes to your mind when you hear the word archaeology? This was an open-ended question, and then the, the answers were categorized. Um, and we saw that actually many people have, have an idea of what archaeology is. So we cannot say Turkish people don't know what even the word archaeology is, because, okay, 17% says that there is no, there is no answer, but um, most of the other people give an answer, and the most being excavation or the science of excavation. Kazakazabidim in Turkish, 36%. I was reading a similar um, research in Thailand, done with a smaller community. None of the uh, categories match, so it was so different. And the, the first category that, they, that came to Thai people's mind was uh, human remains. And we don't have any human remains in, in Turkish uh, respondents, which is interesting. Um, some of the findings of these questions gave us hope about uh, you know, the uh, safeguarding of uh, archaeological assets in Turkey. Some less. This is one of those that gave us hope. Because when we asked about what kind of values do archaeological ruins have, only almost 3% of the people said no value. And then there were uh, some values assigned. Uh, they could choose more than one value, so that's why that it doesn't add up to 100. So they could say intangible and scientific at the same time. Intangible was the, was the one that was uh, rated the highest. And since it's a bit difficult to understand what intangible is, uh, we, we put the categories. We wrote intangible there. We put money. But then when the answers came, hmm. So uh, my money might be different than yours. So we had the need, we, with this question and a couple of other questions, we had the, the, the need to go back to some of these people to ask again, like, what did you mean by this? And we did some in-depth interviews. So briefly, I can say that intangible meant either religious values or they categorized as secular. Like, it is so, I find it so sacred that I don't want to give any, any other kind of value. So intangible covers what I feel about archaeology. So this is uh, another way people explained what intangible meant. Maybe. Um, we also listed the star sites of Turkey, like the sites that we think that everybody would know. Uh, and I am going to show you the results of Turkey, Istanbul, Antalya and Southeast. Uh, so the, the most well-known site is Hagia Sophia, with 78%, and uh, Topkapı, Ephesus, as you can see on the list. Göbekli Tepe is 15%, but please remember that this was done in 2018, so we believe that if we were to do this now, we would get a much higher uh, percentage for Göbekli Tepe. Istanbul has exactly the same ranking, it's just the uh, percentages have increased. Antalya changes, as you can see, Aspandos, which is in Antalya, is now much, much well known. And in Southeast, everything changes. The ranking, uh, the percentages, the most well known site in Southeast Turkey is Hasan Cave, which is not very surprising. But when you see it with the numbers, it is very dramatic. And Zeugman, so more than the sites in Istanbul. Um, so the question that makes us a little bit depressed is, 
as you can see with the black part. This was asked open-ended uh, again. So we said, can you give us a name, one name, of an ancient civilization that lived in Turkey? As you can see, almost 50% of the people didn't say anything. And then the 13% is saying Hititlar. And mostly Etilar, actually, because this was an again open-ended question. So when they categorized, they, uh, the way they said Hititlar was also quite interesting, Etilar or Hititlar. Only after Hititlar comes Ottomans. Of course, this might be because Ottomans are not seen as a distant or an ancient civilization. And if we were to ask this question, have you ever heard of Ottomans? Of course, the uh, percentages would be much higher. But this is uh, when you ask it in an open-ended way. Uh, a, a, a country which is very proud of being so very rich with its archaeological assets, almost half of the population doesn't have an answer to, to this question. Okay, this is um, a question that made us discuss the most. Uh, before showing you the <coughs> results of the question, I'd like you to have a look at the question itself and think about it for a second. So we said, what civilizations have formed today's Turkey? And there were four um, choices and they could only choose one. And uh, when I was presenting the results for the first time at the British Institute, we were a group of, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 people, and we had those uh, little iPads. So I asked people, so what do you, how do you think the Turkish population would have answered this question? And they failed the most with, this, uh, with the result of this question. So this is already giving you some, some clue. So almost 50% of, of the people said civilizations of thousands of years. Uh, when the company had a look at the results, when Konda um, professionals had a look at, look at the results, they said this is the most important finding of the survey because it still shows that there is a potential for people to be together. Instead of saying Turks, Muslims, Seljuks and Ottomans, we put Seljuks and Ottomans in the same category. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, so they don't go for a dif differentiation, they go for the... Uh, the pot that makes it uh, like all, all the same. We also asked some questions about engagement, like how people engage uh, with archaeological sites. One of the questions we, ch we chose to ask was, is there an object that you keep because of its intangible value at your house? Only one out, almost one out of four said yes. And to those who said yes, we asked a follow-up question, like, what are those? It really gives a very nice turkey mm, how can I say? Picture. Like all small, you can just take it in case of emergency and run. If they are not big, there are, are no furnitures. The biggest thing is the sewing machine, so nothing bigger than that. It is kind of small kilims and uh, bucket cup, things like this. Um, again, with engagement, as you can see, 48% have visited an archaeological site before, 12% says, I have a museum card. 68% thinks that people don't visit archaeological sites because of the entrance fee. And 75% says that they would call the police if there was an um, illicit excavation. This might seem a little bit too high, and that was what our, our interpretation was. But when we were doing archaeology in local context workshops, there, was quite, um, there were some people from the security forces that said, it's very low. They call every day. They call twice a day, three times a day. So, okay. <laughs> um, I just want to show you how uh, that demographic, uh, how we can read all this data with some of the demographics. So 48% visit an archaeological site, which means 52 hasn't, haven't. And we ask, so are you planning to visit on your agenda? Uh, and Turkey representative, the Turkey um, numbers, is 20% says, yes, I will. 60% yes, if I could, if I had an opportunity. The other 20 says no. And you can have a look yourselves how that is br br broken down when we look at different lifestyles. So it is changing quite substantially. The important question, has anyone you know ever found a treasure? We talked a lot about this question, how to ask this question. Have you found a treasure? Mm, no. 
Uh, have you ever heard of a treasure story? Oh, too many. Has anyone you know? So we wanted people to think about uh, someone. So 7% said yes. 93% said no. Another thing that is very much relevant to them and road constructions is this question. So these are statements that we, we were reading out to the people and they were saying how much they agree. So the sentence is, historical artifacts could be sacrificed for road and dam construction. 70% of the people actually don't agree with this. And uh, Konda asked this question for environment, so exactly the same question. Uh, environment could be sacrificed for road and dam construction, it's even higher. So people are quite against this, this destruction, at least mentally. So the last um, slide I'm going to show is um, general approaches towards archaeological. So this is another category. So 49% of the Turkish respondents say that they approve the works that works of foreign archaeologists in Turkey are beneficial for the development of archaeology. <coughs> Whereas almost 90% that, that say that uh, the things that were brought out of Turkey, illegal, uh, no, I agree that artifacts smuggled abroad should be returned to Turkey, put it better. But on the other hand, 82% of the people accept the archaeological remains as part of their own culture. It's also quite a high number. And 78% of the people think that archaeological assets are not sufficiently protected in Turkey. So, to wrap up the whole idea of asking, well, I do not know if, if when, when or if this is going to make any, we don't expect it to make, to, to, to have an impact immediately, but we believe that any communication campaign that's built on this understanding is, li is more likely to be reached out to more people. And this is showing us the potentials of asking, uh, asking more about archaeology and building up our activities based on this. And we hope that in the near future we will be able to share more uh, with, with you about what has worked, what hasn't, and how uh, asking works in Turkey. Thank you. That's actually important. Who would like to ask a question? Or something? We'll start, uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting to, to, to hear about the survey that you did. Uh, and again, I think we also heard from Leclerc earlier today the, the public engagement in Turkey is, I mean, is amazing. People are very interested. And yet, uh, I, I recently received an email uh, in Germany, I think that was circulated, which was uh, talking about uh, the number of people who are applying for becoming students in archaeology in Turkey and I think it was quite dramatic. It was uh, a shift from about 4,000 students per year to about 2,500 uh, and 16 archaeology departments closing in mm -hmm. Turkey. Yeah. So how do you explain this big discrepancy between, you know, uh, the I don't know, like the interest of the public yeah. and... Well, you can be interested in doing something, but as long as you know that you are, there is going to be no job opportunities, you don't pick up uh, that uh, profession. I think that is more, you know, people are also very interested in history, if you ask them, <coughs> then they don't become historians. It's always, you know, archaeology, I think, has, has that thing in every country that I know of. You, you go to, a, you talk to a person, I always wanted to be an archaeologist. And what do you do? Well, I study finance. So, you know, and mostly people who study economics or finance has this dream. I think there are more, um, um, like, you know, worries that are uh, reflected on that. And the number of uh, departments, I mean, if we are going to talk about Turkey, the number of archaeology departments has inflated as well. There are so many archaeology departments and uh, they are uh, having troubles in finding students. There are too many universities to be in it. But did, you, did, you ask, did you actually ask the question, like, would you consider a career in archaeology or something like this? No, we didn't. No, no we asked, well, what, do you, uh, what do archaeologists do? So there were quite accurate uh, questions, but we didn't ask for you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. You, you will, please. Um, your talk, especially at the beginning, uh, took me nicely to the be uh, beginning of today's um, symposium to Ian Hodder's uh, 
uh, thoughts about the failures of linking with the local community. And I just wanted to ask you whether you have got any um, any thoughts on his project, his uh, attempts to include the local community, whether perhaps you have even some advice how to <laughs> avoid those failures. I want to start with the Turkish word Estağfurullah because I don't know how to say this uh, in, in English. Um, well, Çatalhöyük has been the inspiration source of all the uh, projects that we have built in, at the BIA, I can say that. And actually, for every uh, professional who did a career like myself in cultural heritage management in Turkey, it has always been an example that we turned to and we looked and then we met people through our uh, Çatalhöyük project. So it is the, 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 the kitchen of, uh, of um, all these discussions, I can say. Uh, and I find it extremely important that we are all sharing the failure stories because th that actually makes it much easier for the people who are starting new projects to do something that can have an impact. And this, uh, the, the TED talk that I uh, showed you is um, a fun and nice way for me to tell uh, the archaeologists who are trying to do public archaeology, and the number is increasing in Turkey, that, you know, there's an alternative way of starting to, to this, rather than projecting our own ideas, because that's where most, most of the time we fail. Because it's not, it's not that, you know, somet sometimes it works. Sometimes, depending on the, on the relationship with the community, there's a potential it works, it goes very well. But if it doesn't, it's usually because of that miscommunication. It's, it's because of it's building up somewhere different. So I can say that we have learned a lot, and I think we, we will learn from, from each other constantly. That's the only way that the field is going to grow. Thank you. Last question. I can say that in the 1990s there was a project uh, that uh, at the institute, which which uh, was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, which looked at the Turkish public participation in archaeological museums or in museums. And indeed, uh, Dr. Bunbury here was the scientific analyst on that. I think I remember the results, but you remember them, Judith? Long time ago. <laughs> um, well, broadly speaking, what I take away from that, that result was that there was a, a hugely disproportionate response to uh, public uh, institutions which had become museums or public or, uh, or religious foundations which had become museums. Um, and that the Turkish public were extremely happily, readily to interact with, 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 with um, former former religious foundations which have become museums, they were much, much less inclined, simply if you like, naturally, to interact mm -hmm. with projects which, or museums which had no obvious root in Islamic religious culture. And the difference was absolutely massive. It was, it was something, like, off the top of my head, it was something like 50-fold difference between the visiting patterns. So there was a clear difference in the, in, 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 in the residence uh, there. But as far as the villages at Chattahoochee, when I was working in the village there, that they knew about Chattahoochee from, from the school books, not, not from the site. <laughs> so the whole dimension of education, primary school education, is in the primary school books. It says, yeah. Anadolu is made from a thousand different cultures, uh, or cultures of a thousand years, of which Chattahoochee is a fine example. Yeah. So you say to a village in Chattahoochee, what do you think about Chattahoochee? Oh, they say, yes, yes, when I was at, at school. Cool. And they say, have you ever been there? So they say, no, we haven't been there. And it's, you know, it's only a mile away. But that was where they, that was where they, 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 were, they were learning it's about It's the it. same with Hitler. Hittitler, actually, mm. the Hittite answer, because most of the time that's what you see in the school books, uh, not the other cultures. Mm. Uh, so that's why people tend to say uh, that there's the ancient civilization that they know of. Yes. So the contrast between this whole network of county museums, in effect, mm -hmm. all over Turkey, and the visitor numbers in these museums from the local Turkish population is, is, is I think, terribly important, because many of them get hardly any visitors at all, and there are obvious ex exceptions to yes. this. Um, there we are. Maybe something we need to talk about for, for a long time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.